Hello, all sentient beings, and welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, where we talk all news, comics, and media related to the... On Alt Mode this week, we have some new covers for Transformers Last Spot Standing. We also discuss Marcelo Mater's comments about unlicensed use of his art, and we review War's End number two in our comic review. Today is Friday, April 15th, 2022, and this is episode 281 of Transmissions Alt Mode. Welcome to Transmissions Alt Mode, the podcast that has drill envy. I'm your host, Charles, a.k.a. Big C, and I'm joined by the excellent Transmissions team. Jeremy, a.k.a. Yakko. Hey, how's it going? And Daryl, the Cybertronian Beast. Is that what we're calling it these days? (laughs) Let's talk Transformers. As always, we start the show by thanking our Donatrions, those lovely people who support us on Patreon and PayPal. Thank you all so much for continuing to help us out and keep the show going. We really appreciate it. If you'd like to become a Donatrion, just go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support. One of the perks of being a Donatrion is that you get access to our bonus uncut episodes of our Transformers live play RPG podcast, Empire of Rust. And this week, Empire of Rust episode 74, Wild Ones, a con clone story comes out. And this is ex- this is the early version of this episode, so this will only be available to do- donate rounds on our Patreon page. This will be out Monday, April 18th. So you'll have to be a Donatron to get access to it. But the regular episode will be out the following week on uh, Monday, April 18th. 25th so that's when you'll go to transmissionspodcast.com slash rust to get that also uh this week on the may on the free feed that's at transmissionspodcast.com slash rust we are starting the the free version of our transmissions crossover part two this is the side story featuring myself and yoshi uh, that we recorded last year and went up for Donatrions uh, at the end of last year in October. Uh, but now everyone will have access to it on the free feed. So if you go to transmissionspodcast.com slash Rust, you'll get part one of that Transmissions Empire of Rust crossover. It's a six-part story. Part one will be this week, April 11th. Or 18th, sorry, April. <laughs> this, this will be April <laughs> Part one will be this week, April 18th. And that's available for everyone. All right, let's uh, get into some comics news. All right, so uh, first up in comics news, we've got covers for the Last Bot Standing miniseries that is coming out very soon. So this is... The series written by Nick Roche and art by EJ Sue. Uh, and so in June, we're going to get issue two. Uh, issue one will be in May, of course. And then issue two will be in June. We've got all the covers for issue two here. Uh, these covers are by John Allison, Sid Ven Blue, and Jim Stafford. So all very cool covers featuring Rodimus Prime. Uh, looks like Rodimus Prime will be the last bot standing. So uh, very, uh, very interesting here. So uh, next bit of news, uh, I guess we could call this, I mean, not it's not feedback for us, but I guess feedback for third party companies in general from artist extraordinaire Marcella Mater, who has done a lot of artwork for Transformers comics in the past and also Transformers uh, other media, you know, just other media. I think some mobile games. He's done a lot of packaging box artwork. Uh, so he's been, you know, contributing a lot to Transformers over the years. But one thing he has not signed off on is having his artwork used for third party uh, packaging and, and uh, you know, other you, for representation in, th- in the third party market. And, and, He's understandably not happy about that because he did not authorize his work to be used in that way. So he has some issues with that. And uh, he expressed those thoughts on Twitter, which I think Daryl is quite familiar with. So I'm going to let Daryl uh, <laughs> explain. 
Sure. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, have you heard of Twitter? I, uh, I have a Twitter account and, uh, and, and, and I like Twitter. Um, so anyway, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Marcelo Mater, uh, he's, he's a great guy, fantastic artist and, uh, has done some comic work, but like, uh, um, like Charles said, he has done a, a lot of stuff recently in the, um, working directly for Hasbro and doing a lot of mainline packaging work. And, uh, recently on, uh, April the 9th posted a, a tweet, um, and just, uh, it just kind of went on a, a bit of, um, a stream of consciousness, uh, 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 post, um, uh, thread, uh, where he, uh, laid out, uh, that he was very unhappy with what, uh, with what had happened with a piece of his artwork and, uh, and the, the, the third party, um, market in general. Um, and we, we've got the posts linked in the show notes, but in general, I'm going to post a picture of, of, I believe it's mech fans toys. Uh, and this is their number 26 shark uh, figures. Um, I believe it's a package of three shark that they've made. And, um, this is a company and we've talked about them before. It's been a number of years because frankly, I've stopped mentioning the fact that they steal artwork because this company is known for stealing artwork. And this is something that is not, not uncommon for this company to do, but right on the front of their box is a piece of artwork with three shark decons attacking hot rod. Um, and, uh, and it's, it's Marcelo's work now. Now he's obviously just finding out about this and it sucks. I'm not an artist. Uh, but every single time that we come across a piece of art that has been, uh, stolen or has been, um, what, what would you say, you know, Charles, what would you call what we've, we've kind of done with, uh, with comic book covers, um, that, uh, people have kind of stolen the, the work and kind of, you know, made, uh, made their own kind of work out of, what, what would you call that? Um, plagiarism <laughs> or i guess i guess it's plagiarism. I don't know. yeah appropriation yeah. okay yeah sure that's it's plagiarism is probably the best term for it so so yeah we've we've found that you know we've we've kind of tackled those those topics a bit uh we are by no means any kind of authority on this but um but it it sucks now obviously marcelo is is i don't know whether he's he's new to just kind of finding out about it but but this happens a lot and, and obviously um, he's not happy about it. And um, so he's gone along and, and, and posted his thoughts about this and, and there's a lot, but I don't want to, and I don't want to go in about, about it. Um, one of the replies was from uh, Matt Moyland, who we've had on the show before. And we know from, uh, from his Lil Formers uh, comic strip. And he, he posted a picture of his art being used on a, mechanic studios uh, box which we've recently discovered is the same company as mech fans toys um so they've they've just kind of changed their name over the years uh this is something that 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 happens and and um, unfortunately these companies they they're already kind of appropriating the design aesthetic sometimes they're straight up stealing the you know um the 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 figure design like they're just kind of uh, like upsizing or downscaling the designs to, to fit what they want to do. So they're really not doing any kind of new design. They're just kind of changing something, um, changing the size. So there's really no, there's no work involved for them. Um, so it, why would they not, you know, steal artwork as well? Right. Um, so anyway, uh, I just kind of wanted to open it up a, a bit of a discussion here because, you know, Marcelo is, a, he's a very well-respected artist. Um, the guy's a, he's a great guy, you know, and, uh, you know, he, he definitely had a, a really good discussion on, on Twitter here with a couple well-known people. Uh, one of which is, uh, uh, Azim Vangsta uh, and, uh, and, uh, they're known for, uh, kind of being a, a part of the third party market um, and being involved uh, with kind of creating their own kind of add-ons and 
uh, being involved with uh, designing some third party fig- figures. So, um, so that was an interesting kind of, uh, you know, discussion to kind of, uh, you know, to, to read. Um, essentially it ended with, um, you know, buy what you want to buy. Um, but you just need to be, you need to be able to feel comfortable with, with where your money is going. Right. And essentially, um, you know, if you want to buy mech fans toys or mechanic studio stuff, you know, know that this company is, is essentially they they don't, they steal a lot of their, their, their assets, um, to make their, their stuff. And, uh, and that's not cool. So Jeremy, let's start with you here because, you know, uh, you haven't said anything yet and we want to get to <laughs> y- your thoughts on this. Um, you know, it's been a while since we tackled this, this topic. What are your thoughts on, on Marcelo and his situation here? Well, I, I feel like it, it is expecting a lot for asking a company that already doesn't respect intellectual property in one area to think that they'll respect it in any other area. So, you know, it's not a surprise that they're stealing stuff. And like you said, we've known about this company for years. Um, it, it really sucks. Like, you know, w- w- third party is clearly intellectual property infringement and much of the fandom either doesn't understand copyright and trademark law or doesn't care. I mean, like you said, buy what you want to buy from the, the consumer side, from the producer of the figure side, this I think opens them up for another aspect of, of a- attack from Hasbro. Not that we see Hasbro actually doing anything, which, you know, mm-hmm. that kind of upsets me more than anything is like Hasbro is like, you know, knows about these IP infringing products, but they don't seem to do anything. So it's essentially just kind of giving it a silent. Okay. Because you're not doing anything, mm-hmm. but it, you know, it's one thing to talk about like design patents and design, you know, trademarks that you're ripping off or characters that you own that are being ripped off. It, it seems to me that like artwork is something that's a lot more clear in the law in terms of this is a piece of art that has been published that is owned by a company. It seems like that'd be easier to go after them, mm-hmm. but I don't know. I mean, it, it sucks for Marcelo. And in this thread, I also saw Aaron Archer hype in. Oh, as did well. he? Oh, okay, cool. Um, Cause someone was like, um, you know, it sucks, but these toys are much better than the Hasbro stuff. And Aaron Archer replied, quality has no connection to ownership. And the guy's like, yeah, I get it. But the other figures are just better. Sorry. I'm like, it's <sighs> people just don't, either they don't care about copyright law or they don't, understand copyright law and i'm like i've personally i've never been like fully against third party i have a couple figures primarily i'm a hasbro takara um collection only like Mm -hmm. just the number of third party figures i have is very small but i i go after the things that are unique designs from the companies or just add-ons which i have no problems with at all like the Azim uh, that you talked about, I have a, a hoverboard from like the one that yeah um, yeah that's something he made. They'll yeah. get used. Yeah, yep. he made those and was selling them. I picked up one at TFCon from him. Things like that, I love. I have no problems with. But things like like the Shark Decons, not only are they um, stealing his art, but they are knockoffs, which means they're a direct copy. With I think they're just bigger of the Hasbro figures. So they just have no original ideas at all. Mm-hmm. And that, that I think is worse than anything. It's, and people are, are also saying that like KOs and third party are different. They're not, they're, they are not officially Hasbro licensed products. So they are the same in terms of the law. So anyway. Mm-hmm. Right now, if I were going to play devil's advocate here, um, you know, which law are you talking about? Right. So most, I'm talking about most, about, if, if not all of these items are, are created in, in Asia. 
right? They are created. Well, yeah. Okay. Yeah. These, these people, but the, the laws I'm talking about are the, the, you know, U S patent and trademark laws, but also they are internationally recognized via like, um, different agreements between com- countries and stuff. So, you know, the, even though they're created in, you know, China or, or Korea or wherever they're created, the com- the countries, you know, if Hasbro was pursuing it, like we saw what, like last year, mm-hmm. you know, a company basically gets shut down. If Hasbro yeah, was going to come after them, they, they can do that. They just, they're obviously choosing not to. Mm-hmm. Well, I think, and we've talked about it before on the toy show, uh, that, that, um, the third party industry is essentially is it's, it's become a Hydra. So yeah. Right. When they kill, when they kill one company, three or four other ones just going to pop up and, and they're just going to take over because they can put one person or two people in jail, but, um, somebody's got to, is going to fill that void of what, what, what they were making. Um, it's just, it's something that is just out there. And personally, I do buy a, a lot more third party items and I, I see the point of, you know, the higher end quality is, is something that's appealing to me. I've also noticed that the, the, the mainline stuff, the quality has become, you know, has, has fallen off quite a bit in the last, you know, a few years. And it's something that's definitely not appealing to me as a collector. Now, you know, we do acknowledge that, you know, one of the points that Marcelo made is that yes, Hasbro products do have to fit through all these safety testing. And third party doesn't. Yeah, you're right. Uh, you know, it does. And, you know, third party stuff can, can skirt those rules. Um, we acknowledge that. And, and, and that's part of the appeal, uh, is that, you know, we can get something that's a little bit more dangerous, right? Um, you know, and that's your eye out. Yeah. But that's, you know, we're also in our forties and if it pokes our eye out, it's our fault. Right. Um, so that's part of, partly, you know, my appeal, uh, one, another one of the points that, that Marcelo does make in this. And I, I, I don't want this to come across as me attacking Marcelo or, or kind of, you know, getting a responding to him without him having the opportunity to, to defend himself. Um, but he does have, he does come up with a, uh, a, um, a, uh, a point that says if you have these great ideas and if you're this kind of talented, uh, you know, designer and that's kind of stuff, come up with your own, you know, your own item, your own IP, uh, and, and, and make a story for that and design something for yourself. That has been done a few times. Um, you remember the, uh, the motorcycle guys, what were the hell were they called? Um, yeah, the they had those, rust, uh, un, uh, unrustable, yeah, unrustable, yeah, unrustable bastards. bastards. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Quattro. Uh, Quattro in the chat uh, is uh, Johnny on the spot with the names here. Uh, so Unrustable Bastards was done, and these were done by the same people that were uh, that were kind of involved with uh, Mastermind Creations, very integral, you know, in that in that uh, in that company. Um, this that died. It had a very you know a very positive kind of start. Everyone was like, "These are cool. These are neat. They look great," and it just collapsed. Nobody could could give those things away at the end, and it's the same kind of thing. The um, there's been uh, original characters that have been made to fit into Transformers. Um, I'm thinking of the uh, of the uh, I believe they were fans projects. Um, they were the uh, the the Scramble City Combiner. Uh, come on, Quattro, where are you? There he is. <laughs> he's he's the uh, the yeah. It's like the um, the combiner that uh, was made to look old. Um, yeah. But anyway, so they bit they did yeah. uh, they did that one, and uh, it was it was sold very very well, and um, 
and then the company folded. So, you know, something it didn't, they didn't, you know, something didn't go right with it to, to kind of save the company. So um, it's hard creating a new IP from nothing. That's why you have all these, you know, they're, they're able to make their money because they're latching on to existing of course, IP. Of course, people know who prime Optimus prime is. They know who ultra Magnus and Starscream are right. They're very identifiable. They can, they can make something from nothing here and instantly sell it because it's, it's already got a history and all they've got to do is produce the toy because it's, it's got a built in audience and yeah, I get the appeal and to start from scratch is we've seen it done. It's almost suicide, you know? Um, so, you know, you're asking a lot of these companies are one person, right? So you're asking one person to kind of, I don't know, you're to, to, to finance or, or to give up their, you know, their life savings or spend their entire time trying to, to do this for, for, for nothing or to, I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know what is involved with, with, you know, to kind of the, the production side of this, but I know, I know that a lot of these companies, a lot of these new ones are just one person. Um, a lot of the bigger ones, they're, yeah, they're, they're, you know, they're full on, you know, full companies, but, uh, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't want to try and understand what is going on behind the scenes, but it, there's a portion of it that is, that is not right. And there's a definitely a portion of it that you got to say, okay, yeah, we're, they're doing something for a fan base that, that really likes it. Whatever mech fans toys and mechanic studios is doing is bullshit. This is wrong. I don't agree at all with what they're doing here, but, um, but the, uh, the stuff that like, uh, fans toys or, um, mastermind creations or, um, make toys when they were still a thing. And some of the bigger ones that are actually, you know, everybody's kind of looking forward to every single year. Those guys, those are, those have almost become legitimate now, you know, they're new engineering. They're making their own stuff. Um, some of them are like planet X. They're doing a, an aesthetic. That's, that's completely different from anything else that's out there. But, um, but yeah, this is, uh, you know, I'm getting off into like a toy discussion here and we're in alt mode, but, um, I want to throw it to Charles here because I haven't gotten his, his, uh, his thoughts yet. So Charles, take over here and, and tell me what your, what your thoughts are on the whole situation. <laughs> well, generally I think it's, you know, I do uh, you know, like, while the, you know, the, the, the law and intellectual property is, is clear in a lot of places. I think there is, you know, th- a scale for third party stuff. Like all the third party stuff is not the same. Like I think on one end you do have knockoffs and what uh, the mech fans toys guys are doing and stealing are where it's, it's pretty much you're just taking other people's work and using it to sell your own stuff. And that's clearly, I mean, that's wrong. That's wrong on a, from a legal side and that's wrong uh, morally and ethically and, and every other way. So that and that's that's the worst the you know the worst extreme of the third party market i think on the other end like daryl like you said the the other end where people are doing original designs but maybe those original designs are inspired by characters you know transformers characters uh and but they take their own they put their own spin on it they do their own original uh, artwork original d- toy design and uh, but but you know they they do capitalize on the popularity of Transformers characters. I mean that that's that's also it's it's not a you know it's not a surprise that they want they say well I can't really you know my original characters are are going to be ignored by the fandom because they're Transformers fans. If I take a character that's you know people are interested in and use that as my inspiration, that will you know that will allow me to to have something that people will be interested in. So. And and there I you know I'm more willing to give you know to give them some at least from my point of view as a customer I'm willing to support that as you know in terms of 
buying those those products like the legends figures that we you know we all talked about like from iron factory or other places yeah those are taking that ip of those characters comes from hasbro and hasbro owns that ip that's that's clear but these these are toys that are that are original designs original uh engineering and uh you know it's i'm willing to say it, it, it's you know i'm i'm at least willing to say in my mind it's it's less bad than just straight up copying uh the work that you know hasbro engineers did and and slapping artwork that you didn't create yourself on the on the packaging so i see that as a as a scale and um you know you have to you have to reconcile in your own mind in your own heart where you can where you can support on that scale so those are my thoughts and also mm-hmm. the add-on like jeremy said the add-on kits i think are pr- totally fair game i think hasbro even uh has no problem with the add-on kits because they encourage people to buy hasbro figures to then use with those add-on kits so no yeah. problem there uh the the figure that i was trying to think of and couldn't are the glacial lords from fans project they are uh, a brand new uh, figure set uh, that are Scramble City uh, compatible. They look like G1 uh, figures. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they were popular. Wasn't there like a fiction to it? Like the, the sh- shipment got lost at the sea and someone just found it and was selling them? Yeah, exactly. They had all kinds of things. And the, the boxes were all made to look like they were aged and stuff like that. It looked, they did us so much work in it. Um, and, and even to this day, I mean, if somebody's got a set out there of them, they all kind of, they all look great together. It's just, um, just, they just didn't take off. Nobody really got behind it because it's not actually transformers. It's just, it's its own thing. I think they look fantastic. And honestly, if I can find a set right now for cheap, I'm probably going to buy it because they're just, yeah, it was, they're great, but you know, they were expensive at, you know, when they first came out and then people just really didn't get it. It's like, it's, it's G one, but it's not G one. It's third party, but it's G one. I, they just, they couldn't wrap their head around it. So, um, anytime that somebody tries to come out with something that's transform forming robots, that's not existent in the fiction or based on something that already exists, it, it flounders and, and, and that's just the way it is. Um, you know, uh, I don't know how else to do it. It's, it's just the transformers fandom. It's yeah, I don't know. It's, it's tough. So I, I understand completely, um, with the way Marcelo is talking. Uh, we've, we've seen it. We've been doing this podcast a long time now and we see it all the time. Artists get screwed. Um, and sometimes even Hasbro is screwing them, right? I mean, it's, it doesn't only happen from third party companies. Even the mainline company will screw some artists. It's not, it's not, you know, only, you know, the, the third parties, but, um, but it happens a lot. And, and when it happens to, uh, you know, a really awesome person like Marcelo, then you really want to take notice and, and really, you know, uh, shout it out from the, you know, any kind of, um, mountain you, you might have. Um, but, uh, that's, that's really the only kind of topic I, I wanted to bring up on this is, is, is that, uh, you know, Marcelo is a good guy and he's getting screwed and there's really nothing you can do about it other than not buying stuff from you know, mech fans, toys or mechanic studio. Um, you know, they, uh, we try to talk about it in the toy show when the, their stuff does kind of get it, come up, come up and get announced. Um, but, uh, yeah, just if you're walking around the convention centers and you see stuff from them, uh, just remember that, uh, they steal art and they steal designs and, uh, they're really, uh, really kind of a, 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 a terrible company. All right. Well, this is this is the longest discussion in uh, alt mode we've had in a while. So, uh, let's uh, j- let's jump into our comic review. 
All right. Uh, we are talking about War Zen number two this week. This is uh, one second. <clears throat> this is written by Brian Ruckley. Art is by Jack Lawrence. Colors by John Paul Bove. Leathers by Jake M. Wood. Editor is Riley Farmer. Supervising editors are David Marriott and Tom Waltz. There are three covers. Uh, the first cover has Pyra Magna and Sound Blaster battling. This is by Chris Panda. Cover B has a um, a seeker on it. Uh, the TF Wiki says it's Sunstorm. I'm wondering if it's Sky Warp kind of in the null space, but regardless, it is Sunstorm colored. And this is by Red Powell. And then Retailer Incentive has Soundblade, or sorry, Retailer Incentive has Soundwave and uh, Rumble and Frenzy. You can choose who is who. And this is by Fico Osseo. So, uh, Charles, let's start with you. Uh, you showed off one of these on, um, on Trips to the Store this week. But which one of these uh, is your pick? I think I'm going to go with the Retailer Incentive cover by Fico Osseo. Um, I think that's the the best, most vibrant uh, artwork of these three covers. Although it is a bit, uh, it's lying in the <laughs> about the story because as we get into the story, we know that Rumble and Frenzy are not hanging out with Soundwave in this issue, which is very interesting. That <laughs> that Soundwave is not in charge of his his cassettes in in this story. So, well, I guess we'll talk about that later on but um mm -hmm. i do like this artwork i think F fico asio has been doing a lot of transformers art over the few over the years and uh, he's gotten better and better in my opinion in doing transformers yeah all right uh daryl how about you uh yeah we uh we gave um we gave fico a whole lot of shit during mm -hmm. uh, his run on revolution uh, back uh, a few years ago, uh, because uh, his, his drawing and his art of the, the transformers was terrible. Um, but uh, he's really come around here with the sound wave and the cassettes on here. Um, I will point this out that the uh, Decepticon symbol is a stamp uh, and it, uh, <laughs> I can notice that uh, right away. It stands out. Uh, like a sore thumb to me but i um but yeah it is the only cover that actually does have a logo on it um it's uh it's just off it's not it's not the right uh you know the right angle for the way that Soundwave is yeah. uh, is standing but uh it's it's the best looking cover out of the three for me uh regardless of the uh the, the decepticon insignia stamp so the ri for me all right um I agree on Pico's work uh, and he's been doing a lot of work with DC lately too. So he, he's, you know, I, I really, I don't think we ever really had a problem with him doing like humans and stuff, but you know, the, the robots are really improved over the years and that is a really nice cover. Um, I would say I also really like cover a, um, it, it's a dynamic cover that actually, you know, resembles something in the story. But I will probably agree with you that uh, Retailer Incentive by Fico is just, it's really good. All right, let's get into the summary. In the Decepticon headquarters, Starscream is walking with Soundwave and suggests a truce when they're surprised by Skywarp suddenly teleporting in front of them. He recently escaped the Sonic Canyons and he asks the two if they're interested in any information about Exarchon. Nearby, Megatron is having a discussion with a hologram of Optimus Prime. Optimus is suggesting a truce of his own, asking Megatron to help save Cybertron and giving him everything that's left over. Megatron is not open to this when the three bots suddenly interrupt. Megatron mutes the connection and Starscream gives Skywarp's information. Not believing him, Megatron asks Soundwave if he concurs, and he's surprised that he does. Returning to Optimus, Megatron agrees to the truce for now. After the connection is cut, he orders Six Shot and Slipstream to the Sonic Canyons, and to destroy whatever they find there. Over the ever-growing Rust Sea, Pyra Magna and her companions are aghast at the sight of the rust worms that are chewing through the planet. 
Jumpstream wonders what this means. It wasn't like this in the future she saw. But Pyra thinks that Jumpstream might just not have seen everything up leading up to that point. Or maybe the future can be changed. However, she doesn't want to risk Jumpstream's life. And if Jumpstream's fate was to die in the Sonic Canyons, then she's not going any further. Jumpstream then teleports away, asking Pyra to call if she needs help. The Autobots that were in the canyon hiding from the Death Source form of Exarchon are surprised when Zetar drills into the space that they were holed up in. He says that when everyone ran, he just picked a direction and drilled. He ended up in an abandoned facility that looks a lot like Exarchon's old base. However, it's no longer abandoned. It's creating seeker clones and has an imploder weapon as well as a giant drill. On the surface, Exarchon is upset that the Autobots have escaped and he orders Sound Blaster to have Frenzy and Rumble find them, teleporting from safe spot to safe spot while she watches the rust worms devour the landscape. Jumpstream is thinking about everything that's happened. She wonders if she can just jump to another time again when she sees what she thinks is a Titan coming to the planet. But there aren't supposed to be any Titans left, so she goes to investigate. Heading towards the Sonic Canyon, Slipstream and the rest of Team Stream near the, the site that Skywarp had indicated. And she tells her team that when she informed Shockwave of their orders, he told them to stand down. Flamewar is okay with this, not wanting to help Six Shot, but Blackjack and Tracer are upset and they continue on to join the assault. Back inside the base, Sound Blaster observes Exarchon preparing a weapon that he had planned on using if he had the chance during the War of the Threefold Spark. He tells Sound Blaster about what happened when he went into the Quintessence and was modified so long ago. He thought he was going to die, but instead he was given the ability to take sparks and bodies. His ultimate goal is to reach the one spark at the core of Cybertron, if he can get there. Outside in the canyon, Six Shot has begun his attack. Cyclonus has shown up, and he takes on Onslaught, while Six Shot is battling Brawn and Vortex. Exarchon emerges from the giant hole at the bottom of the canyon to join the battle, and he is immediately met by Pyra Magna and her team. Nyakon, Megatron has gone to the Forge Pyramid to find out why the three bots that he commanded to deliver a Titan Spark have not done so. They have some concerns. The technology that they're using to capture a new spark and cage it didn't exist during Exarchon's war. They could use it against him, or they can continue to try and get the Titan spark. But Megatron has to make a decision on what to do. Jumpstream has teleported herself into the atmosphere of the planet to see what was falling. She discovers it was an asteroid, but it was met by something as the asteroid burnt up. When she returns to the surface, she sees that Astrotrain has just landed with Devastator riding on top of him. Immediately, she teleports back towards the Sonic Canyons to warn Pyromagna. And that is Wars End number two. Uh, it was a bit disjointed, I think, with the jumping from places to places. Uh, I do like kind of the concurrent story with the ongoing. I, I like having the, um, you know, you're seeing the the conversation from two sides and you're seeing kind of strings that are pulled in one book, the uh, result in the other. Uh, I, so I, I am kind of enjoying this phase of the Transformers story. Um, and I'm hoping that next, like we've got the start of action here and I'm hoping we're going to see um, more of the fighting in the next book, but um. I don't know. This is just a little disjointed. I think it is more written for the collected version. Uh, art wise, I, I think the, the book looks really good. I, I think Jack's art is just, um, just spot on through the entire book. Um, and JP's colors are good. You get, you get lots of different color palettes here with like the rust sea. You have green skies. um, just the, the regular interiors for different places. And then you have the caves. It's just, it's, it's nice to have all these different environments and backgrounds and stuff. It, it's, it's very, a very well-drawn book. I just think it's a little bit disjointed, but it's still enjoyable. So, um, Daryl, let's start with you. Uh, what were your thoughts on the book? Um, well, I gotta say, I like the art. The art looked great. Uh, Jack did a good job on this. Um, the uh there's a lot of uh surface detail i guess you would say is is drawn into the characters uh, on uh on these figures uh, in this book and 
it does it's a little bit more distracting uh this time around but uh um it's a little bit more toy detail a little bit more toy detail they're not putting peg holes in them but uh um <laughs> but it is uh, it is a little bit uh, distracting um i don't know whether you could soften the lines a bit because they're all very hard lines um but other than that i do uh, i do like it um um the way that the uh, the rust worms are drawn and they just they, it makes it look like almost like piranhas the way that they're feeding in in the on the the rust the sea of rust it's just if you fall in there it's just you're done it's um no. the story itself i get how you you thought it was disjointed um i'm honestly i'm looking i haven't read uh the main uh, story 41 yet um i'm looking forward to it because it, it this this is actually picked up quite a bit and uh the story is is really kind of interesting now uh x archon in death Saurus's body is an is a legitimate threat and i feel as though it's it's you know it's really uh it's it's causing some problems for for both sides on on you know in the in the book uh the reveal of his of of x archon's kind of base here is pretty interesting um you know his drill in this uh imploder i guess uh sure we'll find out what that kind of stuff does he's gonna blow the planet up or not i guess he's gonna implode the planet up um but uh I, I like how, you know, the, uh, the story continues on with, uh, you know, a lot of the kind of minions kind of joining, uh, X Archon to kind of help out. Uh, but they're all kind of scared of him Uh, cause he could take over their bodies at any point in time and kill them. So, um, I do like how you do have some of the, uh, the Decepticons kind of, I guess, uh, they're switching they're they're uh, you know their side they're not switching to the autobot side but they're 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 not they're going to fight against exarchon instead of helping him um so they're yeah. going against some orders uh and i they're, like they're that I, jumping from like shockwave to megatron right yeah and and i really did i really did like that i thought it was a good uh a good uh bit of story there's some just dis- some deception in the ranks there um the um the the fight as much as it as as quick as it was um was was well uh, executed and and well uh plotted out um i i'm i'm really interested in seeing cyclonus here cyclonus and i've talked about it before he's pissed he is really upset and you know god help who was ever in his way um, I'm, I'm really interested to see how, how things go with regards to Cyclonus's character in this story. Um, I don't think it ends well for Cyclonus, but I don't honestly think Cyclonus cares. Um, I don't think he has anything left to lose and, uh, and that's what makes him really scary. Um, the, uh, the idea that the book ends with Devastator kind of crashing down on the planet, um, I got me really excited. Bring on the the big combiners. I love it. Um, everybody, I thought this when we talked about maybe the last uh, War's End book, whether or not everyone would be brought back home. And literally, that was the word that uh, Devastator says when he lands is home. So, yeah. And I also see Astro Train in between his legs here. Uh, I'm assuming Astro Train was on this this uh this meteor as it, well or this comet um it says that um when she's watching she sees a rock but then she sees that it's met in space oh. so i think astro train caught up and got um got De- devastator not forgotten devastator is always been working for shockwave so right tells you what where he has he might end up in terms of siding mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I'm excited to see where this goes because um I ha- like I said I haven't read 41 yet, but Computron's on the cover of it. 
So, I mean, you know, I'm excited about that. We don't, we know that the last uh, issue of 40 ended with a Titan landing on the ground. Um, so, you know, these big characters are, are landing. Um, and I, I'm looking forward to just a, a just a, a brawl to end all brawls. So bring it. I'm, I'm excited. Awesome. Charles, what were your thoughts on this book? Uh, it's what it was. Uh, I think, uh, like you said, it was a little bit disjointed, but I think overall I liked all the moments with it. Like uh, there were some really cool moments in the, in the book that I enjoyed. And, uh, I definitely agree that Jack Lawrence's art and John Paul Bove's colors did a great job with the story. Like one, I think some of the subtlety is, is captured in the art. Uh, like there's one scene where, when uh Starscream is trying to convince Megatron uh to go after X Archon and when Megatron asks Soundwave, do you agree with him? And then you have just have two panels where first Soundwave's like looking at Starscream, Starscream's got a serious face, and then Soundwave turns to Megatron and says, Yes, I agree. And then you got a tiny little smirk of Starscream that, yeah, you know, <laughs> I've got it I I got I got Soundwave convinced, so that that gives me an edge. And I like uh, I, I just thought that was really um that little bit of uh of art of subtlety in the art was really well done um i like the how the stories come together we've got all these factions uh fighting you know even the autobots and decepticons they all hate exarchon and, and then you've got shockwaves faction which is all uh they're they're willing to work with exarchon i guess they think that when he wins they'll have some rewards or whatever but then you have like Slipstream's team that kind of fractures where half her team is against X Archon regardless, but the other half is still covertly working for Shockwave. So they say, well, I guess we're, you know, we're, we've got orders to sit this one out. So I, I just think it's interesting to see how ever all the, the Decepticon factions in particular are splintering uh, because you've got Shockwave, who's essentially the, the X Archon, um, you know, devotee inside the Decepticon ranks that everyone was not aware of. So it's interesting. Um, so I'm curious how, I mean, I hope at the end of this, they, maybe this is the end of the X Archon storyline where they finally will defeat him maybe, but we'll, I guess we'll see. Um, also the, I got, I don't know if, if this will ever will be, um, resolved, but it looks like does was X Archon, I guess, captured by the quintessons that that seems to be the implication here um oh, you know yeah, they, they, his, his past yeah the when like the the quintessence <laughs> that uh he crossed into the, the quintessence and then there are some really quintesson like tentacles manipulating him his body and giving him his threefold spark so maybe that's maybe that's just a, a hat tip or maybe that's a clue i don't know but uh yeah i'm i'm enjoying the i i think the the story is re- the the overarching transformer storyline that Brian Ruckley has has created is is wrapping up nicely with both this and the main series ending soon so i think he's ramping the the action up ramping up the 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 um the story and everything so i i like where it's going right now awesome so I guess that is Warzone number two. I'm guessing we're going to do Transformers 41 next week since you've already got the review done. Well, I've still got that Shatterglass review. Oh, is that the one? Uh, sorry, I, I thought yeah. that. Okay, well, I'll edit that for that. <laughs> All right. All right, well, that is Warzone number two, and uh, we will go on to what's next. All right, let, let's uh, joy, jump into Transformers Media News. All right, in Media News this week, we've got uh, a couple things. We're going to start off with an official G1 Grimlock screen print by House Bear, Justin Froning. And uh, so these are a bunch of, there's three different uh, screen prints. Um, they are, there's... The first, the regular 
Dino Mode one, there's only 65 hand numbered 24 by 18 screen prints. Then there's a, a uh, holographic foil paper uh, Dino Mode one. There's only 35 of these ones hand uh, hand numbered. Uh, they're again 24 by 18. And then there's an archival ink mode or oh, ink robot mode uh, print. And there's only 65 of these. And they are uh, 18 by 24 as well. Um, so these are pretty cool. Uh, the holo, the holo foil version is already sold out. There you go. Yeah. All right. So yeah. So this was the pre-orders are going live on the eighth, uh, which was a while ago. By the time you're hearing this, um, so there you go. Um, these look cool. Uh, if you like prints, there's very few of these. I don't know who Justin Froelen is, um, but uh, I'm assuming he's a good artist. These look cool. I mean, it, he didn't rip off anyone else's work. No. No, that has not been done. Uh, next up, we go to the TV streaming news and talk about uh, the BotBots Raceroni, uh, the piece of race car, and uh, with concept art by Mark Mayer. And we see here that the concept art for it started off with something that looked very different than what it turned out to be. Um, the concept art puts it in much more of a dragster looking thing um, with uh, like um, dials at the front and a big engine looking thing at the back with uh, um, and then it uh, and then it basically turned into what we get um, with it looks like a slice of pizza with a couple uh, wheels attached to the back and uh, yeah, that's what it turned into. So the concept art started off and it looked really cool. And then it turned into the pizza, pizza car that it is. Um, but yeah. Very neat. Uh, it's nice to see these, uh, you know, the ideas that they started off with and what they ended up with it. Uh, you know, some sacrifices needed to be made because money. And We've got a new promotional image for Transformers Earth Spark, and uh, essentially it's just the, uh, um, it's just the the, uh, what is it? Optimus, Bumblebee, and two of the new characters plus the two new human characters, um, saying it's coming this fall on Nickelodeon from E1 Studios. Um, and the those new insignias are still on Optimus's shoulders, so. They really haven't changed anything there. Um, that one character on the left reminds me a little bit of Rung. Okay, yeah, the goggles on the forehead, sure. I yeah. can see that. Yeah. Both of the human uh, characters have uh, have these, like, arms that uh, have these kind of glow uh, hands or whatever. Um, I'm assuming uh, these are going to be important in... Uh, parts of the show where they interact with the transformers or take control of the transformers or something like that. Um, either way, uh, these special arms of theirs uh, are going to be, uh, are definitely featured in this, in this new promotional image, but that's it. That's all I've got uh, for media news, except for we are going to talk about uh, Mr. Michael Bay. And a little bit here because Michael Bay was on, uh, was being interviewed for his new movie. Uh, what's it called, Charles? What's his new movie called? <laughs> Ambulance. <laughs> <laughs> yep, that's Ambulance. it. Ambulance. Ambulance. You got it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, uh, somebody called him Ambulance. <laughs> ratchet yeah <laughs> and so uh they were talking to him about uh you know his uh the, the stuff he's done before and then you know the transformers franchise came up because he, he spent uh he spent a decade doing transformers movies and uh so yeah um and the main quote that everyone and all the websites i mean all of them every single website has pulled from this as uh, I made too many of them. Steven Spielberg said, just stop at three. And I said, I'd stop. The studio begged me to do a fourth. 
And, th- and then that made a billion too. And then I said, I'm going to stop here. And they begged me again. I should have stopped, but they were fun to do. So, so there you go. When everyone said, you know, why is Michael Bay doing these? And everyone, you know, we all kind of speculated. They probably backed a truck of money up to his house and said, will you do another one? That's probably what they did. Sounds exactly like what they did. So anyway, um, he obviously acknowledges the fact that, uh, you know, those movies probably weren't the best, um, but they made a shit ton of money and he made a shit ton of money too. So, you know, what, what are you going to do? And, and, you know, the argument's been made, you know, if somebody's going to pay you to do, you know, piss poor work, you know, even if it makes a lot of money, you're still going to do that work. Right. So whatever people like those movies, we can, we can sit here and we can discuss the merits of the the live action franchise for, you know, until we're blue in the face, but it's not, it's not going to change the fact that there are still a lot of people out there that really enjoy those movies. They're, you know, they're popcorn summer blockbuster movies and that's all you got to do or that's all that you have to think about when you watch those movies is that they're made to just turn your brain off and watch things explode and and that's about it does anybody have I mean, any other I've, comments on this yeah charles go ahead these, please. these these are the movies that uh that martin scorsese should have been railing against like he complained about the marvel movies being just you know thrill ride like uh you know amusement park roller coaster rides whatever not being real movies these are the transformers movies are what those are these are the well, these mean, are the movies that are just you know spectacle roller coasters plot story character doesn't matter these are just about they literally the, made an amusement park ride out of them yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> i mean you know i and and I, like the, the they're not i mean i i michael bay is a i mean he's a filmmaker he cares about his craft but the thing is i mean the thing is what do you care about when you watch a movie like he cares about i think getting realistic like realistic looking action scenes like that's why he uses a lot of practical effects to make things look as real as possible combine that with the the cg to make it look really cool and he does a great job with that i mean i mean you can't say that his action scenes are terrible sometimes you know sometimes it's hard to tell what's going on but a lot of times at least the you know the action scenes are well done uh my complaint of course as always is that the transformers were never characters in these movies the transformers were always just giant props or you know and the the focus of the story has always been the humans and i hated that um but you know that's not that's uh that's a um that's not going to change you know drawing people into the theater to see the movie and um yeah and, and of course i complain about continuity the, the movies don't the movies don't care about their own story like they're not they're not internally consistent from beginning to end let alone carrying from one movie to the next but you're not there for the story you're not there for character development you're there for the big explosions and it made a lot of money. He's right. It did make a lot of money. Um, mm-hmm. But it is what it is. <laughs> Jeremy, you want to get in on this? I mean, we, we've said en- enough about these movies. I think I just, I, I like being validated that our suspicions were true. Mm-hmm. I mean, if you look at the first three, Outside of the writer's strike, which really affected the second one, you could probably say that that was a story across those three movies. And then the other ones all seemed kind of tacked on, especially when you started adding, you know, Mark Wahlberg and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, for me, it's still, if I ever go back and watch them for a reason other than having to do it for the podcast, it's always either the first one or Bumblebee. and. Those are the two that have any staying power with me. Cool. All right. Well, and with that said, that will do it for media news.
All right. And I think that takes us to the end of Transmissions All Mode. Thanks, everyone, for listening. As always, we end the show by giving a shout out to our Masterpiece Donatrions because these are the folks who continue to support the show at our highest level on Patreon, and we really appreciate that. That helps keep the show going. So thank you again to John 4 x Good, Dynabot Maximize, and Demon Tech 82. And we will see you next time. Thanks for listening. And bye-bye, everyone. Bye. Later. Thank you for listening to this episode of Transmissions. If you'd like to join the conversation, travel to our Discord channel at transmissionspodcast.com slash discord. Want some cool transmission swag? Feast your eyes on our transmissions gear at transmissionspodcast.com slash shop. If you'd like to support our podcast, go to transmissionspodcast.com slash support or tell your friends about our show. We'll see you next time. Transmissions.